Today I'm talking to Owen Dalton. Owen is a sculptor conservator, a high nature value farmer, and above all, a rewilder. Originally from Dublin, since 2009, he has lived with his two sons, Liam and Shawnee, on their 73 acre farm on the Berra Peninsula in West Cork. Owen released his hugely successful and award-winning book, winner of the Unpost Irish Book Award 2022, an Irish Atlantic rainforest late last year. Hi, Owen. Thanks so much for coming on to the Nature Magic podcast. I've been dying to talk to you. Um, can you tell us where you are today? Good morning, Mary. Um, lovely to talk to you too. Um, and thank you for having me on. I'm down uh, on the Bear Peninsula in West Cork near a village called Iris, um, on my 73 acre farm overlooking the Atlantic, overlooking the Skelligs and overlooking the uh, McGillicuddy Reeks, including Caron Tool. Uh, that paints a beautiful picture for the listeners. So down at the southwest of Ireland, um, so your lovely book, which I read, An Irish Atlantic Rainforest, is has inspired a lot of people. Uh, it is a very important book because it's very hard to tell that story. And one of the things that you say in the book is you hope to throw a pebble into the pond and you hope that the ripples will ripple out. Um, briefly, what is the message that you're trying to tell? Um well, I guess there's two. There are two messages. If we if we distill it down to its its uh, very core, the first one is that nature is in an absolutely dire state, and that is something that you could say uh, uh, in in global terms that's true, but it's particularly true here in Ireland. Um, it's it's hard to know how things could be worse for nature here in Ireland. Literally every indicator of how species and habitats and ecosystems are doing are all showing a, a downward uh, spiral um, that, that is somewhere in between a decline and an outright collapse, depending on, on what you're talking about. Um, so just again, to, to put that in, in, to give some kind of, uh, you know, to, to, to put a form on that, um, the, the, <clears throat> the National History Museum of London in 2018 drew up what they call the biodiversity intactness index in which they ranked 240 nations and states across the globe all of all of them on the planet according to how nature was doing in within their borders and out of 240 nations and states ireland came 13th from the bottom and the thing is that that ties in with everything we know so it's not like that is in some way uh, anomalous to all of the other de data we have on what's happening to nature in Ireland. It, it, it completely ties in with everything. So again, um, that would be my first message that things are really, really bad for nature here on this island. The second message is that it absolutely doesn't need to be that way, that um, things nature can and will uh, come absolutely roaring back if we just take some very simple steps and I guess um, you know and, and sorry those steps that I'm talking about there they are really just undoing the things that we humans uh, do to, to, to stop nature from coming back. Once once you release nature from those constraints, it it uh, it rebounds in the most incredible way. And I guess like um what I'm doing in the book is I'm telling those two stories through my own story of 
buying a, a farm here on the Bearer Peninsula and my journey through restoring the 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 that most of the farm is covered in in temperate rainforest, which was in a very, very bad state when I arrived, as are virtually all our tiny remaining fragments of, of native forest in Ireland from the same two causes, which is which are severe overgrazing, either by livestock, generally sheep, or else wild herbivores that are um, artificially abundant such as uh, and generally non-native invasive species like like sika deer and feral goats um, and what that does is as well as preventing the far forests from regenerating so every little tree seedling gets Im immediately eaten uh, and the forest is una unable to reproduce so uh, over time, it begins to to die out, um, and it it also wipes out all of the incredibly rich ground flora that you should find in a native forest. That that is is very often completely absent, um, but it also um, it it creates exactly the right conditions for. Uh, ingress and uh, takeover by non-native invasive plant species. And down here, the worst of those is rhododendron. So when I arrived um, on the farm in 2009, there was, there was this very, very special forest uh, full of the most wonderful old oaks and birches and, and other about a dozen native species of tree um but it was in this terrible state due to overgrazing by feral goats and primarily goats but also feral uh, sika deer and it was being uh invaded by a whole host of non-native invasive species uh so you had uh, Japanese knotweed, Chilean myrtle, bamboo, mombrisha, gunnera, sycamore. Um, but the worst of the whole lot, and there were others that, that don't come to me right now, but the worst of the whole lot was rhododendron ponticum, which had uh, taken over large areas of the forest and was spreading rapidly. So even in areas that it hadn't taken over, there were seedlings coming up everywhere and small plants so and did they escape from a garden originally do we know the they were um well i'm a, i'm sorry to say that the, the the goats and pretty much all of the non-native invasive plant species were released into the area by a group of people who were living next door uh in a, a couple of decades ago who were kind of living an alternative lifestyle on this acre they bought next to my place for I guess about a decade um, and when they moved on uh, the main the main guy who who was um, who owned the place was a, a German fella and he went off to India and disappeared uh, and I suppose there all the other people who were involved kind of drifted on in various directions subsequently uh, and what they did is they released the goats they had when, when they left they had goats and they released those and they'd also plant into into the into the wild um and they also planted they had planted the rhododendron and all of these other invasive species on that one acre and that was kind of the epicenter from which all of this stuff spread out I never knew that. I really never knew that. And it's funny because we have something called a slow worm in the Burren. You know, Ireland doesn't have snakes for listeners in other countries, but a slow worm is a legless lizard. And apparently it came over with the hippies when they, um, the New Age travellers only a couple of decades ago. And now it's okay. on all the, yeah, it's on all the four. And the, um, was it intentionally brought over? Do you say, it do you know? A pet. Or... A pet. Okay. That's, right. the, that's the story, but I never heard of the guy with the one acre and so much damage being done by one person there. I, you know, it's so easy. Well, what, 
wasn't one person. There was a kind of a okay. community of people there. Okay, but in, like, a short, in a short period of time. So Yeah, you know. I mean, I, I think like it's important to say that it wasn't intentional. They didn't, they didn't mean to do any of this. It was, no. it was kind of like ecological ignorance, really. It was, it was a kind of a, a lack of understanding of, of how such actions can drastically impact. Yeah. Impact of ecosystems yeah so the absolutely goats, I mean, the goats that were they released there was only a handful were released i i don't know how many but i'm guessing three or four maximum and within again i'm not exactly sure but i'd guess less than a decade there were over a hundred of them in the immediate area because you know, of course, in Ireland now, there's nothing to 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 control. There are no um, predators that that would naturally control something like goats. So, if we still had wolves and bears and lynx, um, those goats would never have become a problem because something would have been hunting them. Uh, yeah, and- this is one big issue that I wanted to discuss with you. Um, the rewilding issue, the herbivores and the predators, you know, yeah. the, we need the predator, the top predator for the trophic um, chain. And so and I really feel that you and I are struggling with the same issues, the issue of dropping the pebble in the pond to try and send the message. We have a 50 acre site here that's organic. It, it has different um, habitats in it. And you wrote in your book how you struggled to bring people onto the land because of insurance, you know, and we're trying to bring people on because um, to just so they can experience nature because the shifting baseline, I mean, this is the whole book really condensed into, you know, half an hour, but people don't know what was there before. They don't know what they've lost. So they really, nobody knows this is happening. And it's so frustrating. I'm really frustrated at the moment that spreading the word, um, we need to throw massive rocks in the pond. You know, it's just, it's it's so hard. It really is. Absolutely. And- I couldn't agree more, Mary. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe I'll just finish describing for your listeners what happened uh, in, in, in my place. Um, so, you know, the... the, the um, the it was in a terrible state uh there was this wonderful forest but it was in a in a desperate ecological state severely overgrazed the forest was essentially dying and being overwhelmed by this rhododendron and other invasive plant species so what i did is i applied for a scheme called the native woodland scheme to to put up a fence around most of the forest to fence out the the goats and the seeker and in the meantime, I set to work getting rid of the rhododendron and the other invasive plant species. Um, after about a year and a half, the, 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 the exclusion fence was put up. Um, and, and so uh, the, the, the grazing pressure was lifted from the forest. And over the, the next couple of years, and ever since really, I've, I've, been just watching this absolutely amazing transformation as the forest has come back to life uh, with incredible vitality. So as soon as the the fence went up, what started to happen was that you had numerous thousands of tree seedlings, oaks and hazels and rowans and all the rest of them started to pop up everywhere. So in areas that weren't forested, you started to get these um, tree seedlings popping up and and carrying on because there was nothing to eat them. They were able to carry on and have since turned into new forest. Um, Within the existing forest, there was also a similar transformation in that carpets of bluebells and wood anemone and wood sorrel and celandine and dog violet sprung up everywhere, sprang up everywhere. Um, and I I had presumed that all of that stuff wasn't even there because I'd never seen any evidence when the goats and seeker were grazing it, that the, that these these wildflowers were there. And there were scores of others all just appeared 
And that process of, of coming back to life has has continued ever since. And you've, you know, the 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 the, the, the massive uh, massively increased diversity and abundance of flora has has attracted in far more invertebrates and flying pollinators and and bird life as a consequence of that and even several fairly rare mammal species have moved in lesser horseshoe bats and otters and pine martens so it's been this this wonderful um just renaissance the the, the whole place has been reborn it's like um, the beauty was lying dormant in the ground. Well, it was repressed by by an artificial uh, situation created by humans, essentially. Mm. So, you know, we brought we goats are not natural, nor seek a deer to 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 the to to native ecosystems here in Ireland, and nor are rhododendron and all of mm. the, the other uh, invasive plant species. So we brought that in. We brought those in, but perhaps even far more importantly than the fact that we brought those in, we created the ecological imbalances that allowed them to get out of control. Mm. Uh, so as as we were discussing, um, you know, we it, it's not natural for a landscape to be totally deprived of large predators uh, and and. And under those conditions, the goats were able to to proliferate uh, exponentially. Um, uh, so we we did have herbivores um, in days gone by in Ireland, and and we had predators. Um, mm. What what would have been the native herbivores of the land, and the native well, it's, it's just from the of, point of view? Yeah, it's kind of complex, really. I mean, the the. You know, Ireland is a very special case because there's a lot of debate about what's actually native here and what was introduced in in prehistory. So, for example, the 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 species of deer that's generally held to be our only native species of deer, which is the red deer, um, it looks like they were probably introduced in the Neolithic by early farmers to have something else to hunt in the in the um in the landscape and pro probably the same is true of wild boar but you know i mean these are both species that are indigenous to to the rest of europe essentially so why they weren't here uh, in ireland if if it's true that they weren't here at the start of the holocene my my guess would be that that was entirely again for artificial reasons to do with what was happening in Europe before the ice the ice age ended. But mm. we're kind of going off on a bit of a tangent. Yeah, we we are. But I think it's very interesting. So ideally, I mean, the forest obviously our little packages are tiny islands in a in a desert of greenness. So it is a different sort of what we're trying to do. We have a bit of a mosaic, and I think you do too. With you have some cows and sheep, but um, ideally we need rewilding on a large scale with herbivores and predators to maintain that most, mo this is my understanding, I may be wrong, yeah. to maintain that mosaic of landscape where you can have the, you know, the barn owl living on the edge of the forest and feeding mm. over the meadow, um, the bats um, roosting and in the wetlands. It's really important to distinguish between livestock and wild herbivores, especially wild, especially when I say that, I mean wild herbivores that are regulated by, by predation. Uh, so, you know, they're two entirely different things. They're, they're, you know, okay, so they both eat plants, but that's about it in terms of the similarities. The, the way they behave and the way that they interact with wild flora are, are almost entirely different. So the predator would chase the herbivore into the woodland and then the the meadowlands wouldn't be like a grazed off uh, field that we'd be used to seeing today. Well, it's, yeah. it's hard to know, really. 
But I essentially, think that... essentially um, what livestock do is because livestock know there's no risk of predation, okay? Uh, and the same is true of wild herbivores when there are no uh, predators in the landscape. They know that they're, they're not at risk in any way. Um, so they will just hang about and eat everything um, everywhere. Uh, and they'll keep on breeding until their numbers far exceed the carrying capacity of the of the habitat and the landscape. When you have uh, herb wild herbivores that are um, interacting with predators, um, thing you, you basically what you've got there is a completely different situation in which. These are different elements of an ecosystem that evolved together and function together. So herbivores, if they know that they're, they risk being predated, they'll avoid certain areas where they might be ambushed or why, where it might be easy to ch easier to chase them down and so on. And that uh, completely changes their behavior. So, you know, areas that they avoid that are more risky are going to, the, the vegetation is going to be able to flourish. Uh, trees and other flora are going to be able to return. Um, and you're going to get much more of a patchwork, a mosaic, as you said, of different types of habitat. And another key thing in, in understanding the differences between livestock and a wild and grazing within a wild ecosystem of, of wild herbivores is that the numbers are a tiny fraction of what they are with livestock. So when we create an, a field and we stick cows or sheep onto it, um, the numbers are are way higher than you'd ever get of or the, the 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 level of herbivory if you like is just way way higher than it would be in a, in a natural ecosystem yeah i mean unless you have a large area that you can try and recreate like neck in norfolk or wherever it is um what we've only 50 acres so we're similar we're less, we're smaller than you um, yeah. And we have had um, paddocks as well. So what we try and recreate, we have a very low number of grazing stock. We have three cows, um, two sheep, some donkeys, and we graze the meadow, and, but only between October and February, then we take the animals off. So we're trying to kind of re recreate that mosaic. So then you leave room for the plants to regenerate, which has, which has been completely successful. We don't feed the animals on the meadow um, as soon as they've finished, you know, they're getting hungry, we take them off. So there's no nutrients going back in there. And then we have 25 acres left over to nature. And as when we opened 10 years ago, people said, you know, why do you need a sanctuary for bushes? Because this is the mindset people don't understand. But now this is changing slightly. Obviously, COVID has been in the middle of it. But in 2019, we had 30,000 visitors here. And all our aim is to bring people into nature to experience it. And that yeah. may be the first I open their eyes. You know, if they could see your beautiful rainforest to say, this is actually what we've lost because people do not know. And that's what I'm actually, you know, at my wits end with um, how to actually tell people. What do you think is our action to move things forward at a quicker rate? Well, it's very, very difficult because as you say um, so rightly, one of the big uh, challenges in, in Ireland is that most people have never experienced wild nature because if they, if you, if you get in a car and drive from one end of Ireland to the other, all you're going to see is an endless succession of fields with interrupted only by, you know, maybe housing estates and towns or blocks of Sitka spruce. Mm-hmm other monoculture tree plantations that's you know like there's very very little 
on this island that doesn't fit into one of those categories. Mm. If you walk Uh, down our boreen at the moment, the other farmer who happens to be my brother-in-law, very good farmer, conventional, you know, they've been trained how to produce, has a silage field. It is pure green. The other side of the boreen, we have our wildflower meadow, which is covered in orchids, dog, daisies, absolutely everything. And you're walking between these two landscapes. And the one on the right, the green field, is what people think nature is a green field and 70 years ago um i i have a friend who is nearly 90 now and she said when she came to ireland first she drove through med rainbows of meadows and even the flowers on the hedgerows have gone now yeah so she remembers I think it's really important to understand you know um if we're talking about shifting baseline syndrome it's very easy to look at the the losses sustained by nature in the last 60 or 70 years uh, during the, the Green Revolution, as it's been called, which is basically a kind of a an acceleration of agricultural practices based on heavy use, to, uh, heavy use of chemicals and machinery. Uh, and there's been a, a massive loss to nature in that period. And people, as as you're alluding to, people are some people are aware of that. So the, the, there's a there's an awareness that you know there aren't as many insects around, there aren't as many birds around, there aren't as many of all sorts of things around as there were maybe when older people were young or whatever. But it's really really essential to understand that even if you go back a hundred years time here in Ireland or anywhere else, you're still looking at a completely trashed landscape. Um, it's just, it was less trashed than it is now. Um, the the destruction of natural ecosystems on this island has been going on for thousands of years. Um, probably since around the, the, the well, since the, certainly since the arrival of farming, but even probably before that, you know, because... It's well known now that Mesolithic hunter-gatherer societies, um, even though they are very few in number, they still manage to eco- to impact ecosystems quite gravely. Um, and that was through hunting out all sorts of animals. So, I mean, if you go back to the Pleistocene, uh, if well, let's go back even further than that. Uh, if... I think if you really want to understand what Ireland would be like in a natural state, you can't look at this island in any period uh, since the last ice age. Because since the, since the last ice age, it has been impacted throughout by human activities. So you really not need to go back to the last interglacial, the, the Eemian, to get an idea. Uh, and you know, it would have been just so much richer, you know. And people say, as you say in the book, you know, um, well, I'm not sure if you said it in the book or on Twitter or something. People are always saying, oh, humans are part of the nature. Humans are not part of the ecosystem. We can do without them. <laughs> well, I think that's, and that's, they've a really, impacted. that's a really tricky one. You know, yeah. that's a really, really tricky one. You need to, you need to walk a careful line between... Um, coming out with uh, of what to me is is patently untrue, which is that people are part of nature. If people were part of nature, we wouldn't be experiencing a sixth mass extinction right now, which we which we most certainly are. But on the other side, we need to be very mindful not to fall into the trap of misanthropy because, you know, while we're not part of nature, nor are we completely separate from nature, we we evolved on this planet like any other. Uh, we we evolved in natural um, circumstances, uh, and we were absolutely dependent on nature. So we, it's all a bit more complicated. We're not part of nature, but we're not separate from it either. Uh, and it's it's just a lot more complex. And people don't like complex generally. They like to say, oh, people are part of nature or or then you get some really distasteful kind of um, 
views on the other extreme, which is that, you know, people are a virus or, or some kind of thing. And that's, that's really, um, it's really not a good road to go down, no. I think. And also that you have to be very careful to use gentle language, trying to send to not sell this message, but everybody can get defensive very quickly because for farming, obviously livelihoods are at stake. Um, what is the one, what action can people like us take? Are we just going to keep going with the same thing? Um, you're spreading your message through the book. And I think that creativity and that beautiful writing is a catalyst for change as well. What else can we do? I don't, I, I think, well, I certainly feel I'm doing everything I possibly can right now, you know, which is, you know, the first, the first step really in creating change, particularly when people are oblivious to the need for change is to, is to, is to create awareness. Uh, that is the most fundamental thing that you can do, I think. Uh, and I'm doing what I can to do that. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's essential to 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 be kind and to engage with people um, while not standing for any nonsense either, of course. But, you know, like, I mean, I I certainly I think that we need it's it's really crucial to say that we need to 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 arrest and reverse the collapse of of Irish nature. But it's also essential that that happen that that happens in a way that's fair to farmers and rural communities and and gets them on board um both because to not do so would be wrong because these are the people who live in such places but also uh because it, it simply won't work if we don't you know if if you have this kind of a scenario where people living in in rural in rural parts of the land feel that there something is being imposed or forced on them it'll it'll be counterproductive it'll backfire so and but also i th i think there's absolutely no reason why we can't marry those things like all of the evidence shows that uh, it's in people in in the countryside's interest to be to to be letting nature come back, especially and and if it's done in the right way, I think I think people need to be incentivized. You know, people if if you're living in a place like the Bear Peninsula and you're a sheep farmer, you're not going to give that up unless you've got some other other income that can replace that. You know, I mean, that's just a basic fact. And we need to be we need to recognize that, that you can't tell people to stop sheep farming um, without providing some kind of an alternative. Uh, and I'd go further and say you can't tell people to stop sheep farming at all. It, it has to be up to them to decide. You have to give them the choice of being able to carry on what they're doing or say, look, there's this other option, which is you know you you'll earn you'll probably make more out of it because the the expenses are far lower and the amount of time you've to put into it is far less um and you know but it's up, uh, completely up to you to decide which you want to do and and if people are given that choice some will carry on doing what they're doing and some will say well you know that that would actually quite suit me and that's the way you do it one thing that I think is really uh, important to say um, is that my perception is that there has been an incredible groundswell in Ireland recently of interest in the natural world, of awareness of how important it is, and anger um, at the, the state that it's in on this island and you know I was I was becoming increasingly aware of that before the book was published with I was getting you know lots of emails and letters and phone calls and other 
messages from people who are increasingly in increasing numbers they they want to find out how they can learn more and how they can make a difference themselves um but that has exploded for me since the book came out and it's hugely encouraging because it shows that people do care and they they are starting to stand up for the natural world uh, and to say, we're not going to accept this state of affairs anymore. Mm. I think people do care. Um, I might have said before, I train sustainability courses for adults. Um, and the last group was a group of baristas. So the Irish government is is putting out this 50 hour leaving cert level course on sustainability for everyone that does any course um, that's funded by the government. Right. But anyway, I've done a few of them so far. They're with Fifty Shades Greener, the amazing Raquel Naboa is the manager, of my boss. But every single person from HGV drivers to apprentice jockeys to baristas has a passion for nature. There isn't one. But they don't understand because the climate crisis has been put at a greater urgency mm -hmm. than the biodiversity yeah. crisis. Absolutely. And that is what we don't under we're, we're hearing climate 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 but actually the biodiversity is definitely equal um if not greater uh, emergency i completely agree with everything you've said except i don't think that it, we're hearing climate 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 i don't think we're hearing about climate enough not true well but, but we're if we're not hearing about climate enough then we're 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 you know we're we're way off uh with as regards ecological the ecological crisis because it's only gaining a tiny fraction of mm. even what climate is gaining you're you're absolutely right on that mm. um um is there i know it's very hard to pick a favorite tree and if if you can if you look on owen's website you'll see some wonderful imagery uh, of the forest but is there something or some particular part you could talk to us about today just to leave a beautiful visual image in the listeners' minds? Sure. So uh, the other day I was standing, I, I was beside this one particular tree that would be, you know, I mean, I guess there's, there, there are so many different special, very special trees in the woods, you know, hundreds really. Um, but there are probably about a dozen that would stand out, you know, just for sheer characterfulness in some way. Uh, and, and also for age, I guess that's usually a, an important part of it, too. So there's this one oak that I was beside the other day that's very, very old and it's growing on the side of an escarpment. So it's just right at, at the top of this. Uh, cliff I guess uh, which has a cave in it so there's a there's an, there's a cave going into the rock underneath the tree and you can see the tree's roots coming through into the cave and this tree is very very old it's very the, the limbs are quite incredible because they they extend way out into space uh where the where the where the escarpment is um and it's covered in epiphytes so i mentioned earlier that that the forest here is a rainforest and we that the, the what gives that away is that the trees are covered in epiphytes uh epiphytes are plants that grow on trees other plants but generally trees um without being rooted in the ground so you wouldn't include ivy or honeysuckle in as epiphytes because they grow on trees but they're not but they're rooted in the ground so here the epiphytes would be mosses and lichens and um ferns like polypody and filmy ferns but on this particular tree, there's there's a far greater variety. There's also wood rush growing as an epiphyte and even dog violet and celandine. Uh, That's a beautiful and, image. Yeah. And when I was when I was standing beside it the other day, um, there's this there's this kind of track winds its way up the, the, the trunk of the oak. So the oak is uh, the bark 
as is the case with old oaks, it's very, very deeply furrowed and rough and covered in, in moss. But running across this um, transversely to, to the, the, the grain of the, of the bark, I suppose, um, there's, there's a deep track has been worn away into the moss, uh, to the bare uh, bark of the tree by a colony of ants. So horizontal to the... So, well, it's actually diagonal. diagonal. So it's kind of winding its way up the tree. Oh, and wow. if you if you put your nose close to it, you'll see this kind of like this procession of ants going in either direction. And they have a highway. <laughs> yeah, a via apia. <laughs> and they have a, a nest at the base of the tree. So they come in and out of there and, and they're going up the tree for for or I suppose there are things that they they get at the at the tree, maybe aphids or other insects that make it worth their while to to troop all the way up and down. And another interesting thing about that spot is that it often on the the what's underneath the oak at the bottom of the escarpment and outside that cave, there's a hollow that often floods. So when you get times of of periods of heavy rain. It, the, it floods and you get this big kind of a, well, a largish kind of a lake forms temporarily for for a, for a half a day or a couple of days or whatever. And it's wonderful. And you have lots of buckler ferns uh, protruding out of the water. And it's very, very wild and very, very rich visually and also um, in biodiversity terms. It's incredibly rich. That's absolutely magic. I'd just like to say on behalf of everybody, thank you for what you've done um, by really using your experience. And as you said, sh throwing awareness out there, um, which is so hard to do. And you've done such a good job. Um, I, thank you, Mary. What I would say is, is that I feel absolutely that there is no choice in the matter for me, that if I if, to not do that, would be an abdication of responsibility on my part because I've been gifted so much by the, by this place and all of the wild nature that that's here. It's brought me so much joy and so much wonder into my life that that to just say, well, that's fine. I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm I'm going to enjoy this, uh, and I don't feel any need to to try to to use it as you were saying as a pebble to create ripples of awareness i think would be it would be a, a a failure on my part and it would be it would be um it would be a, a betrayal i think yeah i i feel the same way about this place uh, sometimes it can be hard just to keep on <laughs> um trying to spread that message yeah so the book is beautiful as well it's like a walk or a journey into the woods and do you want to tell us where we can where people can get the book and how they can contact you and we'll put everything in the show notes as well sure um so the book can be purchased in any half decent bookshop certainly in ireland um abroad in the uk or europe or the united states or wherever else it can be ordered. I mean, I think in the UK it can be it can be ordered into any bookshop. They can get it for you and bring it in, but you you probably won't find it on shelves there. Um, but wherever you are, you can order it uh, online as well. And there are several bookshops based here in Ireland that um, either will will ship for free. Some of them will ship for free anywhere in the world. I think. Uh, or else it's it's peanuts like you know it's a, it's a euro or two to to have your the book a copy of the book shipped to wherever you are in the world so those those bookshops are uh, and you can find them online the the gutter bookshop is one another is upstairs books another is uh, kenny's bookshop in galway uh, and eason's as well sell, sell it online and and so do plenty of other places as well if you Google an Irish Atlantic rainforest, which is the title, uh, it will come up and mm -hmm. lots of outlets that sell it will come up too. 
we have it in our bookshop in the gift shop as well and okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put it up online as well so great yeah thank you so much um it was an absolute pleasure talking to you and we'll put the contact details and the website and links to the book shops that you recommend show notes and thank you for taking your time today because i know you are very busy and you've done a lot of media work and everything because the book um i forgot to say has won prizes it's been hugely successful so thanks again Owen. my absolute pleasure thank you mary news from bar nature sanctuary this week We've just heard that we have been awarded Best Nature Attraction Republic of Ireland 2023 by the European Travel Awards. Also, RTE Nationwide will be filming in August to air over the winter and cheer everyone up with the abundance of summer when we are huddled up in front of our fires. Yesterday, the pearl bordered fritillary, the rarest butterfly in Ireland that only exists in the Burren, was photographed sitting on our traditional boat sign. Orchids are carpeting the meadow and all the farm rescues and pets are enjoying the mild weather.